Um, I am going to report on first, second, and third John, uh, who wrote the letters. It's, the letters do not say who wrote the letters, but it is believed to be John, the son of Zebedee, one of the sons of Zebedee, um, who is the author of the Gospel of John and the Book of Revelation. And in second and third John, he is referred to as the elder. And then uh, in the beginning of, in the introduction of first John, it has, it lists some characteristics that clue in that John wrote these three epistles. Um, some are contra contrasting figures such as light and darkness, life and death, truth and lies, and love and hate. Also, some expressions and phrases are found in 1 John, also found in the Gospel of John. There's a list in the beginning also of that. Also, the mention of eyewitness testimony um, harmonizes with the fact that John was a follower of Christ from the beginning. And authoritative manner um, that would be expected from an apostle of Christ. And then the suggestion of advanced age agree with the early tradition of the church concerning John's age when he wrote the books. Um, let's see here. And then, when were these written? Um, all three were written around the same time, between uh, 85 and 95 AD, and it was after the Gospel of John was written. From where? There is nothing in the letters that state where the letters were from, but traditions of the church placed the writings in Ephesus. And to whom they were sent? First John was addressed to all believers as 2, 12, 14, and 19, 3, 2, and 5, 13 state, but the letter does not indicate who they were or where they lived. And First John is believed to be a circular letter sent to the Christians in a number of places. And then Second John is addressed to the chosen lady and her children. It is believed that the chosen lady is an unknown Christian woman or a figurative designation of the local church there. And her children are that of the Christian lady or members of that local church. And then Third John is addressed to Gaius, who was a Christian in one of the churches of the province of Asia. And then why they were written. First John was written because his readers were confronted with an early form of Gnostic teaching. So John wrote this letter for two reasons, to expose false teachers and to give believers assurance of salvation. And then on page 1925, it lists some of the five important errors that Gnosticism taught, which the letter goes through in, in, in forwarding those um, beliefs by the Gnosticism. Second John, uh, during the first two centuries, the gospel was taken from place to place by traveling evangelists and teachers, and believers customarily, customarily took these missionaries into their homes and gave them provisions for their journey when they, when they left. And since Gnostic teachers also practice this, Second John was written to urge discernment in supporting travel, traveling teachers Otherwise, someone might unintentionally contribute to the propagation of heresy rather than truth. <coughs> and then third John, these traveling teachers sent out by John were rejected in one of the churches in the province of Asia by a dictator leader, Diotrophes, who even excommunicated members who showed hospitality to these messengers sent by John. And John wrote this letter to commend Gaius for supporting the, the teachers and to indirectly warn Diotrophus. Um, the epistle's chief concerns and teachings. Uh, 1 John, in the beginning section 1 through 4, is the reality of the incarnation, which is very similar, has, uses many words similar to the beginning of the Gospel of John. Also, in the sec second chapter, beginning at 18 to through 27, um, it warns against the Antichrist and how there are many Antichrists coming and um, how to recognize them. And to recognize them, it is um, the man who denies Jesus the Christ. Um, that's how you recognize 
false teachers. Um, and then another big emphasis in this letter is love, um, which is a key word in throughout most of, throughout all of this epistle. Um, and 2, 9 through 11, it regards the need for love of your brother. And then, and also in 3, 11 through 18, it's the same. And then in 4, 7 through 20, 21, it tells us God is the motive for that love. And then also in chapter 5, it talks about Jesus' belief in Christ as Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And especially in verse 6, um, this is the one who came by water and the blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. And if you want to, you can look at the footnote. It talks about why this is so important here. One of the Gnostic teachings um, is that Christ or Jesus became became Son of God at his baptism, and then left before his death. And this verse is to point out that Jesus was the Son of God from birth to his death. And then in the second epistle of John. Um, there are four things. Uh, love the truth, which it can be found in verses 1 through 3. And then live the truth in 4 through 6. Look for the truth in 7 through 11. And long for the truth, 12 to 13. And then in John, 3rd John, um, Gaius is a commendable Christian, which is in verses 1 through 8. And Dio Trephus is a conceited Christian through 9 and 10 because he um, refused to welcome the brothers who were sent by John. Um, some key chapters and verses. 1 John 1, 8-9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive, our, forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness which is very familiar in our Lutheran liturgy. Um, 1 John 4, 7 through 10. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who know, who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his only, one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then in 2 John, a key verse is verse 6. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands, as you have heard from the beginning. His command is that you walk in love. And then in a key verse in 3 John 11. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. And then some co contemporary applications. We are to be watchful for the Antichrist and false teachers, for we know the truth through the promises of God and the words of the Bible. The Antichrist and false teachers do not know the truth and lie concerning the truth. We are to live and walk in the truth. And then according to 1 John 3, 21 to 23, Dear friends, if our hearts do not, do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he has commanded us. And then in 5, 14 to 15, this is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. And we are just able to come before God with confidence and prayer through Jesus Christ, that we know God will hear us 
and answer our prayers accordingly. And then some commentary and Bible dictionary. Um, the Holman Illustrated Bible Dictionary had this to say about First John, it, how it lacks um, typical characteristics of a letter written during this period with the absence of the identification of the sender or an address to any recip recipients except the nonspecific little children. It is more like a tract or a treatise intended to address a particular situation. And Luther said that First John should have been placed right after the Gospel of John. And then concerning First John 1, 9, uh, which is if we Um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Um, that verse is a re re reiteration of God's faithfulness to his new covenant, promise of salvation in the old covenant. Um, this verse is found from Jeremiah 31, 34. I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This reminder is a reminder that he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness re-emphasizes the truth John had stated in verse 7, that God will, because of his character, secure their eternal glory by continuing to cleanse believers from all future sin. He is faithful to his promise and always does what is righteous. And then um, my key insight, I guess I didn't realize how soon uh, these heresies and false teachings came up, especially during the time of the apostles. And, but today, we as Christians have the truth, and we have knowledge of the truth through the Word and the Gospels in the New Testament, and we are able to live by the truth, as is a theme in all three letters of John. Any questions? Um, you spoke about First John. You were talking about the heresies that he's speaking against. Was he out against Gnosticism or adoptionism? It was Gnosticism. Gnosticism, okay. It, it states that in the introduction first John. It was an early form of Gnosticism. In that light, um, you mentioned that we should check out page 1925 in our Concordia Study Bible, which details five points about Gnosticism. I think it would be helpful if you went through that a little bit, okay. because I know it's review, but you know, for a lot of us here, uh, this is something that we haven't seen a lot of before. So please go over that just a little bit. Okay. Um, the first one, it states man's body, which is matter, is therefore evil. It is to be contrasted with God, who is holy spirit and therefore good. Um, this is why they couldn't accept that um, Jesus was the son of God, because God couldn't live in a man, because man is evil and God is good. Um, uh, the second one is salvation is escape from the body. Achieved not through faith in Christ, but by a special knowledge. Um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, the point here is that if you want to be saved, uh, eventually you can get rid of that evil body, which is material, and uh, ascend into the spirit world. Of course, you have to have the right knowledge to do that, but uh, that's how salvation is, to escape from the material and to enter the spirit world. And then Christ's true humanity was denied in two ways. One, some said that Christ only seemed to have a body, a view called docetism. docetism, from the Greek dokeo, to seem. And others have said that the divine Christ joined the man Jesus at baptism and left him before he died, a view called serenity. Theanism. Yeah, and I think that Serinthianism is what chapter 5 talks chapter about, five, about the water and the blood, six. the idea that, and by the way, this is also a cardinal um, doctrine of Islam, that um, when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified only as a man, okay? The spirit left him. And, you know, that's, that's another way of undercutting, you know, God making us righteous and just by virtue of his payment of our penalty, the vicarious atonement. Um, it's just sad how many so-called religionists cut that part of Jesus out, like that's non-essential. He's a good man, a good teacher, he shows his good morals, I've lived a good life, but the way of the cross 
they don't want to hear about that. They don't want to promulgate it either. And that's basically the teaching of Sarinthus, and that's also part and parcel of the teaching of Islam. And um, well, of course, Muhammad showed us the way. <laughs> okay, it's worth righteousness, obviously, according to Muhammad. But okay, enough said. Continue, please. And then, or since the body was considered evil, it was to be treated harshly. Okay, that could lead to self-flagellation and asceticism as being perhaps a way of um, earning some points with the deities by, you know, <laughs> uh, mistreating that which is material, including your body. This seems pretty tough, but anyway, it's part of it. Go ahead. And then paradoxically, this dualism also led to licentiousness. Uh, the reasoning was that since matter and not the breaking of God's law was considered evil. Breaking his law was of no moral consequence. Okay. That was helpful. Thank you. I have a question of you, if you don't mind. Um, and, and I appreciate that you mentioned it twice, because it serves to be mentioned twice. In reference to chapter 1, verse 8 to 10, you said it's in our liturgy that um, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Could you tell everybody here where in our liturgy it is? It's in the confession and absolution. Okay. All right. So that's how we uh, typically start our worship services, uh, to make a clean breast of things before God and to come to him and receive, be ready to receive his grace because now we have confessed the need for it. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right. Appreciate that. I do not have a whole lot to add, but uh, as usual, my two bits worth, whatever that is. And you've covered most of the main points. Um, You'll notice that John has a way of speaking that is kind of unique, as he oftentimes has a tripartite means of address when he speaks to the little children and to the fathers and to the young men and to the various things that will pertain to these three different groupings. Uh, the fact that he addresses the little children would suggest that he is probably an old man by this time. And uh, there's kind of universal agreement that he was uh, writing in the 90s of the first century, which probably means that he himself personally was also over 90 at this particular time. John lived to, to, to a great old age. Uh, he, I think, outlived all the other apostles. So he's the last of the apostles. And, of course, fittingly then, he also gets his... Some of his writings at the very end of the New Testament, especially the Apocalypse, which uh, uh, we'll be looking at more tomorrow and perhaps even a little bit today. So um, his way of address is kind of unique. And um, I appreciate you're going into Gnosticism a little bit because uh, it's really behind some of the issues that John addresses here. He states over and over again that many antichrists have gone into the world, and then he defines what he means by antichrist. And that is a lot clearer than we find it in the uh, teachings in Thessalonians, where um, you know people wonder, well, who really is this man of lawlessness? Obviously, it was a way of saying to these Thessalonians, slow up. I mean, the end is not here yet. Uh, other things will still happen before he will return in glory. But here, in John's time, he says there are many antichrists, and basically the antichrist is that uh, one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah, um, and he is a liar. He is antichrist. That, that's simple enough. He's against uh, the, the Christ idea. And um, so... Um, there's, a, as you have mentioned too, uh, Wesley, there's a lot of connection between uh, these epistles, especially First John and the Gospel of John. And uh, one of the things that uh, hits me, of course, is the word love. Um, God so loved the world. Yeah, we, we all remember that one from John 3.16. But it's in First John that we have uh, even 
greater focus on this concept, and that's why it is often called the epistle of love. Um, and in chapter 4, we find the statement, God is love, twice within just a few verses, 4 verse 8, 4 verse 16. To me, uh, it seems to me that's about the most profound statement you could find anywhere in Scripture, that God is love. I mean, it's short, it's to the point, and what does it say? It says something that he is like no other God. No other God is ever known to have been total love, to have loved the world so much as he did, um, and to have loved me <laughs> as well. <laughs> you know, it's very comforting to be able to not only say it, but to feel it and to know it. So uh, there's a certain profundity in the simplicity of this letter. Uh, John perhaps writes more simply than most writers, but by the same token, more profoundly at the same time. And this is perhaps paradoxical that sometimes the things that are stated most simply can at the same time in the, uh, at the, in the pen of a, a skilled writer be the most profound and that certainly is true of John's writings. All right, um, 4 verse 10, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Uh, to me, this is even more profound than to be able to recite the first and second table of the law, that, you know, uh, uh, the first uh, um, commandment is we should love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and all of our mind, and we should love our neighbors ourselves. Well, that's nice. I, I know I should do that. But to reflect on the fact that God actually um, so loved us as he did through the incarnation and all that that entails, um, that should be my motivation to reflect uh, similarly to others. And immediately, you know, uh, I, I, I sort of can get excited about that where the other one is more like James says. It's kind of a a uh, piece of information that's in my head, I, can I translate into my life? Well, with some effort I can, but here it, it, it does it for me. All righty, um, moving on. Second and third John have some things in common, some things somewhat contrasting. Obviously, they, they both are brief, and they both address the matter of um, how to treat itinerants, um, those who travel and, and uh, bring their teachings. But um, there's kind of a different focus. In 2 John verse 10, they are enjoined not to show hospitality to false teachers, which of course is the burden of 2 John, the false teachers that um, have invaded, um, well, the um, domain of the beloved lady, which is probably the church to which John is writing, or as well as I said, it could also be to her family. But uh, Kyria is feminine form. The church, um, Ecclesia is also feminine. So the beloved lady, probably the church, don't give hospitalities to such false teachers because thereby you are endorsing the damage that they do. On the other hand, second John, a uh, third John rather, um, scores a person named Diotrephes who uh, refused to give aid to uh, John's missionaries. See, John's missionaries were faithful teachers, but here is this man who refuses to give hospitality to faithful teachers, and indeed one is enjoined to support um, those who um, minister in, in connection with the word. Uh, of the Lord, which uh, Diotrephes is not doing. He opposed John's authority, those who also gave support to John's missionaries, and John says that he will deal with Diotrephes when he comes. Alrighty, I think uh, those are perhaps some of the little nuggets that I s tried to drop on occasion, and I hope they're of some use to you. Um, well, Second John reiterates the teaching about Antichrist. There are many Antichrists and deceivers who've come into the world, and uh, they do not acknowledge that Jesus came into the flesh, which, of course, is the Docetic heresy and the Cerinthian heresy. Uh, Wesley detailed that for you has to do with the water and the blood in connection with, you know, did Jesus come only uh, uh, as a divine being in connection with, with um, the... Um, ministry between 
his baptism in, in the time that he was um, taken to the cross, or was he son of God during his whole life? Uh, that, of course, is the teaching of John that he was, and of Sorensen that he was not. 